Assalamu alaikum. My name is Rahat, and I'd like to welcome you to the first Islamic Finance Conference hosted by the Islamic Finance and Ethics Society today. We're a consortium of societies from member universities from LSE, SOAS, King's College London, and CAS Business School. We would like to thank you for taking the time out today on this lovely Saturday morning and joining us to discuss Islamic finance and how the industry can move forward. From personal experience, I've looked at the Islamic finance industry with skepticism. I just felt it was a complex way of rebranding and repackaging products that are available in conventional finance. And I'm sure many of us have often felt the same way in this room. But our skepticism and our ability to critique is part of what will propel this industry forward. We need people with great ideas to come forth and explore how we can trade ethically in a society that often feels like it's riddled in corruption, greed, and fraud. If we can't envision an economic system without usury, in injustice, and unfairness, despite this being a command from Allah, then it means that we have embarked upon something truly incredible. If we believe that this task is impossible despite this being a command from Allah, then it means that the reward will be truly immense. The industry itself is small, but we have large hopes and great ambitions. And whenever I feel overwhelmed by the sheer scale of work that is left to be done, I find hope and inspiration in the verses of the Quran where Allah asks, is the reward for excellence anything but excellence? We hope that you'll enjoy this day through engagement and discussion and find it stimulating. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to approach me or a member of our team who've been working tirelessly over the past five months. I would now like to introduce our first speaker of the day. Daoud Vikri Abdullah is the president and CEO of the International Center for Education and Islamic Finance, the first Islamic finance university in the world. He has been in the finance and consulting industry for over 38 years, longer than I've been alive, <laughs> with, significant <experience> in <laughs> with significant experience in Latin America, Europe, the Middle East, and Asia. Prior to working at NCF, he was a global Islamic finance leader for Deloitte and holds a bachelor's degree in economics and social history from Bristol University. So please join me in welcoming Dawood Vikri to the stage. Assalamu alaikum and a very good morning to you all. It's, it's a great pleasure to be here and uh, d d the, the welcoming comments I, I think were welcoming and I, I jest with that. But um, I've actually been in the industry longer than 38 years. It's a bit out of date and uh, um, as, as my four sons, uh, the eldest of whom is 31, and the youngest, I think, is just coming up to 18. Uh, I, I am from the land of the dinosaurs, apparently. And uh, you noticed I was able to get up here without the use of either a wheelchair or a, or, or a Zimmer frame. But it's, uh, it's great to be here. And it was great to have the, uh, the opportunity, uh, of the, the invitation from the organizers. And I'd like to thank them for that, because I, I just happen to be in the country um, I have a series of meetings this, uh, this past week and uh, early next week. Sadly, I won't be able to stay with you long because I have some other commitments today, but uh, I will be here in, spi in spirit. Um, congratulations to uh, the organizers and to the Islamic Finance uh, and Ethics Society for all these uni universities um, for holding the first student-organized Islamic finance conference in the UK. It's a, it's a remarkable achievement, and I've watched the social media, and I've watched the promotion, and I'm looking around the room, and there aren't that many empty seats. So, you know, thank you for taking time out to be here. And thank you also, uh, on behalf of the organizers, for not only inviting me, but also some very, uh, uh, very erudite and, and professional and effective speakers and panelists for, for later in the day. Um, I would be remiss, in fact, I was, uh, uh, because there's an eight hour time difference between me and, and Malaysia, I've been talking with my team and with my students and with the president of our student association at INSIF, and I would be remiss not to pass on their congratulations um, and also 
uh, their greetings and good wishes for further collaboration. And, and behind me is the only promotional thing I've got. This is a, a picture of our website. And if you want to engage with me or with our students, take a note of that and just file across and you'll go down and you'll see all my recent presentations and our recent research uh, information, so stay in touch with us. Um, our um, president of our student association at INSIP asked me to remind you um, all that um, there are uh, at INSIF right now 2,000 masters and PhD students from over 80 countries around the world. 60% uh, of them are online and they want to be your friends. Uh, they want to help, uh, they want to assist, uh, they want to share with you and they want to engage with you in, in whatever way you see fit. That also includes, because I had a message from the chairman of our alumni association, the 1,100 PhD and master's graduates in Islamic finance that we've generated in the short 10 years that, that we've been in existence. Malaysia is quite a remarkable country. I say that not only because I live there, but I'm married to a Malaysian and I feel obliged to support my wife from time to time. Um, but it's also given me a career in Islamic finance, which is something I never expected to get 25 years ago when I first discovered this subject. Um, about 10, 11 years ago, in fact, it was 2005, Malaysia was very much in the same situation that you find yourselves here. And I looked at the um, uh, letter to the industry that was crafted, and I think it's very well crafted and very re re relevant, and uh, uh, there's been a, quite a bit of correspondence and discussion um, about that letter to the industry, which I think is in your briefing pact, and, and, if, and if it isn't, you'll, I'm probably speaking out of turn, but there, there should be something there. Um, if it isn't there, then it's really asking for greater collaboration with industry and, you know, why are we here? We're trying to find jobs. We're trying to engage with an industry. And as I mentioned, uh, 10, 11 years ago, um, the same situation existed in Malaysia. Uh, we had a number of universities in Malaysia teaching Islamic finance, um, and we had a growing Islamic finance industry, and this is largely because of commitment from both government but more particularly from regulators. And my current boss, the governor of the Central Bank of Malaysia, um, Zeti Akta Aziz. When I was uh, first appointed a managing director of an Islamic uh, financial institution in 2005, I had a number of challenges. And uh, one of them really stuck in my mind was, well, where are the people coming from? Because we were in competition with other um, windows which were being asked to become full-fledged subsidiaries and the market had opened up to three international licenses in banking in Malaysia and that put some considerable pressure on staffing and on human capital we, we had uh, those of you who follow soccer or football will understand price inflation in the transfer market so we had a lot of people um, you know, chasing after supposedly better paid jobs, but not necessarily having the right qualifications to do them. And I remember a conversation I had uh, with the uh, late deputy governor of the central bank um, at that time, and he was asking me how it was going in my new role, and I was explaining, you know, it was coming out of a consultancy practice and not having worked in a bank for several, well, almost a decade. Um, it was a little bit challenging to go back into, into running a financial institution. But the biggest challenge was just getting good quality people. And part of the problem was that this is hot transfer market and people were just going for a few dollars more, literally. Uh, but also there didn't seem to be enough connectivity between industry and academia to produce the right programs to produce the right kind of people to move into senior positions within is Islamic finance. And these problems were solved, I won't say at a stroke, uh, the transfer market was solved at a stroke by the Malaysian government implementing some rules to say if you want to poach somebody from another Islamic bank, you need to pay an additional transfer fee equivalent to six months salary. Uh, it didn't, it dampened down the market but it, what it meant was, and that six month salary didn't go, you know, to, you know, it didn't, it didn't go to the person who was being contracted. It went into, a, uh, into an Islamic finance training fund, uh, which was run by the central bank. And the other thing that was created, which was more medium to long term, was a postgraduate university called INSEAF, which I proudly now run. 
Um, and that was seen as a medium to long-term solution um, to actually provide the right caliber of people uh, for the Islamic finance industry. At that time, I have to admit, it was seen pretty much as a Malaysia-only initiative. Uh, why? Well, because Malaysia was one of the few countries that was actually focused on developing Islamic finance. But it became evident within two or three years that this was becoming much more global. Um, the first intake of students at INSEF uh, was for a master's program called the Chartered Islamic Finance Professional. Uh, the name has now since changed to Masters in Islamic Finance Practice. And there were 33 students from seven countries, most of them being Malaysia. We now have, and this is seven and a half years later, 2,000 students from over 80 countries, and we've graduated um, just under 1,100. I think it's 1,087, if my memory serves me well and if my brain isn't frozen after the walk up Kingsway to, to, to get here, uh, who've done masters and uh, uh, PhD qualifications. What is more significant, and I think this is a, a, you know, a message I want to reinforce, is the structure of INSEF. It is a university. We're accredited by the Minister of Higher Education in Malaysia. We are well on the way and have nearly completed what is called our AACSB accreditation. Those of you who are academics or run business schools will know that this is the highest level of accreditation any university can get anywhere in the world um, for what it does as a business school. Uh, Harvard Business School, for example, Sloan MIT, London, London Business School, etc., all have AACSB accreditation. We are three and a half years into a five-year journey and we've jumped every hurdle and INSEF will get this accreditation of that, I am sure, because we're working hard on it by 2017. And we will be the most accredited and most acclaimed Islamic finance university in, in the world by 2017, if we're not already, but we will be on a par with all those other business schools. Another major difference that was set up at the, uh, at the outset for INSEF was collaboration with industry. We are not structured traditionally as a university. We do have a Senate, it's called the Professional Development Panel, and we have a Strategic Outlook Committee, both of which report directly to the board, um, called the International Governing Council. 95% of the membership of both of those groups are international practitioners and regulators. 5% are academics. 95% of our governing councils are made up of industry practitioners, regulators, um, senior managing partners or global managing partners from professional development firms such as Deloitte or KPMG. Uh, we have regulators from securities commissions from central banks. We have Islamic finance practitioners from UK banks, uh, from Gulf banks and so on. And this is a significant difference, and this was done quite deliberately at the outset with INSEF, was to ensure that what we did as an academic institution was relevant to the industry, not just in terms of the development of our curriculum, which is driven by the industry. We have to get it accredited by the ministries of education, sure, but it's driven by input from industry focus groups. And in addition to that, 99% of our PhD research subjects are set and funded by industry. They're not academic esoteric discussion documents. They are relevant to the industry. Indeed, I was just chatting with Stella Cox, and you, mo many of you will be aware that the UK, uh, the Bank of England has recently uh, initiated a, um, uh, a, a consultative document on Islamic liquidity. Um, already, INSEF is providing answers to the chief economists of the Bank of England on, on how to grow and to develop this. And they came quite deliberately to us because they've said, you've probably got the best concentration of brain power um, uh, to be able to assist and help us. Uh, and this is relevant to the industry. So I'm, I'm stressing those two points. The way we're structured in terms of who, who drives and controls us uh, and also uh, the output, the curriculum and the research topics are very much uh, designed and crafted uh, uh, by, by the industry. In addition to that, within Malaysia, we have two important organizations outside of the regulatory environment which are defining professional standards. One is the Chartered Institute of Islamic Finance, the CIIF, 
of which I'm a member and I'm a qualified CIFP, um, and also something called the Financial Accreditation Agency, which accredits professional qualifications in Islamic finance. And the journey for Islamic finance will need to be something like the accounting profession, which has been around for a long time, where you get a, an accredited qualification from um, uh, uh, know, ACCA, for example, or CPA Australia, and that is internationally recognized. The industry, the Islamic finance industry, is doing the same thing, and the bodies in Malaysia, the CIIF and the FAA, are assisting in this. The FAA, by the way, is already uh, accrediting the CISI, the uh, Securities Institute here in the, in, in, in the UK, as being relevant to Islamic finance. So this is an important step forward. We need to harness this energy, and I'm going to close up now with just a, a couple of final remarks. It's wonderful you're all here. It looks like a, a, a terrific agenda, and you have some wonderful people here. Uh, most of who, uh, whom I have the honor to call at least colleagues and probably most of them friends because we've been around some time and uh, um, I'm, I may be the oldest, but uh, not quite the oldest anyway. I'm going back to that wonderful introduction where I hobbled up to the stage. But um, it's important that the ideas that you have today, you, you have an outlet. It, it's about harnessing the creative disruption. Nothing's going to change unless we do something about it. And I always like to, uh, you know, finish up with a, with, with a couple of sort of phrases or, or quotes which I, which I use very often. Uh, but before I get there, let me just remind you, please engage with us. Uh, engage with me, engage with our stakeholders, our students and our alumni. We want to help. We've been down this, this road before and we've learned something and we've made mistakes. And you learn from mistakes. But the, uh, the whole faculty, the students and the industry are with you. Uh, and we want to support you, and we will do all we can to promote the cause. Uh, indeed, I sit on um, a, a British um, government subcommittee called the GIFI, Global Islamic Finance Investment Group, um, uh, and, and I will use that mechanism as far as I can to help and support you or to, vo you know, to voice the concerns that you have. So we're behind you. And there are two quotes. One is mine and the other is Nelson Mandela's. So I'll give you Nelson Mandela's because he's much more significant than I am. But I think he made a wonderful quote a number of years ago which revolved around the fact that education is the most powerful tool that we have. And I certainly subscribe to that. My own quote, which I like to uh, close on, is there's much to do and not a moment to lose. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamu alaikum, guys. Uh, my name's Sharam. I'm a student at the LSE, and I am the treasurer of the LSE Islamic Finance Society. And it's my pleasure to be here today to be chairing the Generational Debt Panel. Um, this is a topic that is really um, you know, in the news right now with the tripling of the student fees to £9,000. Um, and I know it's very relevant to many of the members of the audience who are either were students recently or are students at the moment. And you know, we're having students entering the workplace with up to 40,000 pounds of debt before they've even worked a day in their lives. And yeah, I think it's gonna be really important in the issues that we're gonna discuss today about the role of debt in society, um, you know, how this affects us going forward in terms of pensions, all this kind of stuff. Um, you know, it's gonna be really interesting to, to answer these questions. So just to give a quick introduction to our panel today, uh, we have Mr. Iqbal Nassim, who's the chief executive of the National Zakat Foundation. Um, he's been at the head of the foundation since 2011, um, in charge of collecting and distributing zakat and sadaqa throughout the United Kingdom, um, and raising awareness of homelessness. Uh, we also have Mr. Ben Dyson, who um, is the founder and head of research at Positive Money, uh, which looks at the role of debt in society and the creation of money. And finally, we've got Mr. Stuart Hutton as well, who is the Chief Investment Officer of Simply Ethical, working with individuals, families, and small businesses, um, giving an insight into uh, financial advice. Um, just to go over a quick uh, format of how the session is going to run, each of our speakers is going to speak for about 10 minutes uh, each. 
Uh, and then after that, uh, we're going to open up to the floor for Q&A. So if you guys um, please do have questions ready. This is a fantastic opportunity to ask some very knowledgeable people um, any burning questions that you have about this issue. Um, but I now like to invite Mr. Iqbal Nassim to take the floor. I'd like to begin by echoing some of the comments we heard in the first uh, session just by uh, commending and applauding really the Islamic Finance and Ethics Society for organizing this conference. Uh, and uh, it's a fantastic lineup of speakers uh, that we have today. Uh, and actually, as I was coming in, thinking about what this conference might be like, a conversation came back to my mind when I was speaking to a, a close friend who's involved in the industry, uh, who, when I asked him whether he was going to a, a few of the conferences that I knew of, Islamic finance conferences this year, he said, this year, you know what, I'm not going to go to any of these conferences. And I said, well, why not? And he said, well, they're all the same. Uh, but I think and I hope that this one will be quite different, uh, organized by students and uh, by people who clearly clearly interested and I think sincerely interested, and I think sincerity is the important word here, sincerely interested in doing something to progress appropriately uh, this uh, whole industry of Islamic finance. So hopefully today will be different, uh, although many people here this might be your first Islamic finance uh, conference that you've attended. Um, and with that, I'll go into the, into the topic, uh, which of course is debt, and um, speaking to uh, a group of students uh, about debt uh, is when I was thinking about what I should do and trying to second guess uh, maybe what some of the others would be talking about, I thought I'd just take a very, very first principles approach. Okay, what is the Islamic view on debt? What is the Quranic guidance around debt? What did the Prophet, peace be upon him, say about debt? So at points, or probably throughout, most of what I'm going to say in this sort of eight minutes or whatever that's left, you might feel you're more in a mosque than in the uh, London School of Economics, but here we go, I'll give it, I'll give it a go anyway. Uh, the word debt in Arabic, or the Arabic word for debt, is dain. And the word dain has uh, implications or root words that mean, uh, that pertain to imprisonment or humiliation. Uh, Yawmuddin, in the in this opening uh, surah, the chapter of the Quran, when we talk about Malik Yawmuddin, we talk about God being the master of the day of judgment, as it's translated. But deen comes from this same root word, which kind of implies the day when everything is settled, all debts are settled on that day. Um, the debtor is considered within the Islamic framework, and obviously we, un we can understand this anyway, as the one who is really and truly imprisoned. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, in one of his statements, he said that you're, when you're referring to uh, somebody's companion or someone's friend uh, who mentioned about the fact that his friend was in debt, he said your companion is being detained or imprisoned by his debt. So that phraseology uh, was being used. If you look at debt in the Quran, it's quite interesting. The longest verse in the Quran is actually all about debt, uh, interestingly enough. And it's all about particularly you know, all the particulars that we should um, adhere to and think about when we enter into a contract between a creditor and debtor. So the very first thing or the very first guidance that is offered is that make sure you write it down. Make sure that it's clear about what exactly the terms and conditions are in relation to this debt or this, this contract that you're entering into. There is also, uh, interesting, before we go into the more sort of, let's say, practical or, or, or worldly side of, of, of this uh, topic, there is also this concept in the Quran, um, as I was sort of looking at this, considering this uh, last night, which I reminded myself of, of the goodly loan, okay, of the, of the loan that one makes to God. And then we think, well, what does that mean, right? And the goodly loan in the Quran, for it's from uh, many verses, but one of the verses that comes to mind in, in chapter number two, Al-Baqarah, uh, where God says, Man hasana. Who is the one out there? Who out there will lend a goodly loan to God? Okay. That he may multiply it for that person many times over. And God is the one that contracts and expands, and it is to him that you shall be returned. The concept being, or the goodly loan to God, meaning the sadaqah, the charity that we give. And so there is the encouragement to give charity. And the interesting thing about that, I thought, uh, was that perhaps it's only God who can repay a loan many times over and be almost allowed to do so. In a worldly context, when we exchange loans between each other, obviously the Islamic principle is, well, there should be no increase upon what was lent in the first place. So an interesting concept, but I thought I'd just mention it there. Now, as far as it comes to getting, getting into debt, well, it's a bit like divorce. Okay? Avoid it as much as possible. It's permissible, but it's permissible, but really try and avoid it. Try and keep it together. So try and, just as you try and keep your family together, you know, try and keep your financials together, your economic stability together by not getting into debt. That's the 
the, 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 the principle or, his, if you like, how debt is considered. So again, one of the prayers of the Prophet, peace be upon him, was Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-ma'tham wal maghram that, O oh God, I seek refuge in you from falling into sin or from falling into the heavy burden of debt. And then, he, and then someone actually asked him, one of the companions of the Prophet asked him, you, see, you seem to seek refuge from debt all the time. You seem to be doing this very often. Why do you do this? He said, when a man gets into debt, he speaks and tells lies, and he makes a promise, and he breaks it. The consequences of being in debt are far more than just, you know, the, just being this, you know, the situation of owing somebody money. The individual consequences uh, from a mental well-being standpoint, from a spiritual standpoint, from a communal standpoint, are very, very significant. Uh, and we, we, we see and experience that, and we have experienced that, we understand that to be the case more when all of these things come uh, to a certain boiling point, it seems to be an explosion point almost within our community, within, within our society. But the fact of the matter is that these basic pieces of advice within our tradition, you know, have already pointed us to, to all of these things. Uh, being in a debt and actually passing away in a state of debt, okay, and especially when one had the means to actually repay that debt but didn't do so, okay, is again considered to be a very, very serious matter such that in one situation the Prophet, peace be upon him, actually hesitated to pray the funeral prayer over an individual who died in a state of debt and who could have repaid his debt but didn't. And until that debt was repaid, he hesitated to do so. In another tradition of the Prophet, uh, the Prophet, uh, peace be upon him, mentioned that someone's soul was sus is suspended from entering paradise until, that, until their debt is repaid. So these are very, it's a very heavy matter, very, very he heavy matter when you look at it from, this, uh, from the spiritual standpoint. Uh, and from this Islamic standpoint. Uh, in another, to give the other sort of uh, side of the coin, if you like, the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, whoever dies free from three things will enter paradise, those three things being arrogance, cheating, and debt. But if you have to take it on, then there are also some more principles. So if you've got to get, find yourself in debt, and perhaps most of us, potentially, I don't know, some of us, most of us, who knows, are in debt, then there are, Islamically, the foundational principles are three. Number one, that you better be determined to repay it. So entering into a debt that you have absolutely no idea okay, where, how it's going to be paid, and then you kind of think of the subprime sort of situation, you think of the lenders and all the rest of it. Okay, but as far as this is concerned, okay, the, from an Islamic standpoint, the borrower is the one that must exercise caution. Don't enter a debt if you absolutely have no plan of how exactly you're going to repay it back. Um, and it should be for something that is, is permissible, of course. Uh, just wanted to mention a couple of things before I try and relate the topic of zakat quickly to debt, because obviously zakat is the is a topic that I kind of spend pretty much every day of my life considering and thinking about, um, which was the various uh, some, some other du'as or prayers that the Prophet peace be upon him used to make, okay, in relation to debt, and and one of them uh, which I remember reading a long time ago, but in just doing some research around this, came across again. It's, it's an extremely powerful, extremely powerful prayer, uh, and it begins with um, it begins with many, many phrases to praise God and to recognize his greatness and all the rest of it. And right at the end, after all of that, the only request is to free, free one from debt. And that's actually quite significant because when we make prayers, okay, there are some prayers where you know, the request comes immediately. Okay, in this particular one, there's that, um, uh, a huge process of recognizing the magnificence of, of God, of Allah, of his power and all the rest of it, and then asking one to free one from debt. So uh, without going into all of the, uh, the Arabic, although it's very beautiful, Okay, the translation is, uh, O God, Lord of the seven he heavens and the exalted throne, our Lord and Lord of all things, splitter of the seed and the date stone, revealer of the Torah and the gospel and the Quran, I seek refuge from the evil of all things you have total control over. You are the first and there is nothing before you. You are the last and there is nothing after you. You are the greatest and there is nothing above you and you are, the, you are aware of all the subtlest secrets and there is nothing closer than you. Settle our debt for us and spare us from poverty. Okay? So if you're a student, and you're feeling, <laughs> you're feeling under the cosh, or you've graduated, then this is what you should be saying. And very particularly, in another situation, the Prophet, peace be upon him, came upon one of his companions who was sitting in the mosque, and, he, and it wasn't the time for prayer. And he said, this, this person's name was Abu Umama. So he said, oh, Abu Umama, why do I see you sitting in the mosque when it isn't the time for prayer? And he said, there's only two reasons, worries and debt. Okay, I'm here in the mosque, because I have a lot of worries, and I'm in debt, and I don't really know where else to go. So he said, Shall I not teach you some words which if you say them, God will take away your worries and pay off your debts? He said, yes, O messenger of God. He said, say every morning, and again, I'll, I'll spare, the, spare you the Arabic just for the sake of time. He said, O God, I seek refuge with you from worry and grief, from incapacity and laziness, from cowardice and miserliness, and from being heavily in debt and being overcome by other people. Every morning and every evening. 
And these aren't things I'm saying, I, by way of, to the extent that I can, these, these aren't things I'm just saying so that we can just theoretically appreciate them. I'm saying them by way of advice. You know, please do, do these things. If you're in debt, or you, if you maybe do these things, these aren't there just to, you know, just to um, you know, make us feel happy about ourselves when we hear them, but actually to implement a practice. And we need to believe sincerely that these things will bring uh, that relief. The attitude of the lender is very, very important because there is so much associated with the lender giving respite to the one who is in debt in an Islamic framework, in an Islamic context, that the amount of reward there is for somebody who may have lent someone some money, that person is struggling, you know, to either give them respite, so for every day that somebody, you know, for every sort of overdue day, if you like, that somebody isn't being paid back, but they don't bother the person who's, 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 lent, who's, you know, who's borrowed money from them, they give them some space, they give them some time. For every day that that happens, it's counted as a charity for them. And if they're able to write the debt off altogether, Okay, then that is a great, a, there's a great reward for them. And it comes down to a, essentially a very, very basic pr Islamic principle about human interaction, which is that how we behave with each other is how we should expect God to behave towards us. There is a very, very foundational tradition of the Prophet, peace be upon him, that says, Irhamu man fil ard, irhamkum man fil sama. Show mercy to those who are on earth, and the one who is above will show mercy to you. Okay, and actually just prior to that, Ar-Rahimun yarhamhum Ar-Rahman that those who show mercy to each other, the most merciful shows mercy to them. So similarly speaking, if I forgive somebody who's wronged me, then I can expect more that God will forgive me. If I give respite to somebody who owes me something, then I can hope that for my shortcomings in my relationship with God, that he will give me that respite too, etc., etc., etc. So there is a very, very strong principle there, and it's something for us to bear in mind. Very quickly, zakat, as we know, is the cornerstone of Islamic social welfare. And there are eight, of the eight categories of the distribution of zakat, one of them are for those in debt. So those people who are in debt, out of necessity, uh, they can't afford to repay despite their best efforts, and especially when that situation is causing a situation of, um, uh, if you like, a splitting of relations, a breaking of relations between lender, uh, and, uh, between lender and borrower. Uh, then it is absolutely valid for zakat to be used to alleviate okay, someone who is in debt. So at the National Zakat Foundation, amongst the beneficiaries that we have in this country, and all our zakat is collected and distributed within the UK, okay, we do deal in certain cases with debt situations. Once, of course, we've looked at all of the other ways in which somebody's debt could be relieved through the conventional means. But if there's a valid reason or, or, or a particular case where we feel someone's uh, debt or indebtedness can be relieved through zakat, then we, uh, we, do, we do do that. Uh, there are other interesting things to talk about. We can leave them for the Q&A about student loans and whether we, how you consider that with zakat and all the rest of it and there's a whole, you know, all those kinds of things going on as well. Uh, and there are, I, I, I wouldn't be doing my job as, as the chief executive of the National Zakat Foundation if I didn't finish with a quick plug uh, for the <laughs> National Zakat Foundation, uh, which is not so much actually in terms of you giving your zakat because uh, arguably many students don't have much zakat to give. But if you do, of course, uh, then uh, I'll be here with my bucket to take it from you at the end. Um, <laughs> but the, uh, the thing I wanted to mention was that we have a, a, volunt a voluntary program actually specifically targeted to, uh, to students and those in that kind of 16 to 24 uh, age bracket, which uh, it seems like most of us are, are in this room. I shouldn't say most of us, most of you uh, are in, in this room. Um, and so if I can ask you one quick thing, just take out your phones, take out your smartphones. Everyone take out your smartphones? Everyone take out your smartphones? There you go. Go into Chrome or Safari or Mozilla Firefox or whatever it is. And just type in Zakat Heroes, so Z-A-K-A-T. This is only if you're a 16 to 24. So Ben, you can put your phone back. That's fine. Uh, <laughs> Zakat Heroes, so Z-A-K-A-T heroes.com. And this is just a voluntary program to engage in four or five uh, challenges, if you like, quick and easy challenges over the next few months, in the build up to Ramadan, to raise awareness and, and support our efforts to educate people and help them to understand that educate, uh, the calculation uh, aspects of, of Zakat. So zakatheroes.com, if you go on there, I think you can very quick, I'm told, I'm told, a very quick registration process uh, that you can go through to sign up for this initiative and uh, you won't regret it. All right, thank you. It's, uh, it's already about nine years since the financial crisis started. Um, there's a strong argument that it's not actually over yet, although a lot of the, uh, the banks in the financial sector would like to, to think that it is. Um, that financial crisis started because there was too much debt in the economy. There'd been a huge increase in the amount of lending prior to 2007. And this led to a debt fuel bubble um, eventually exploded in the financial crisis. So you would think that since then, the emphasis would have been on 
paying down that debt and reducing the amount of debt that people have. Um, it's interesting that the, uh, the government since then has all been about, you know, we've got to get banks lending again. We've got to get credit flowing back to the economy. And actually, globally, the total amount of debt in the global economy has risen by 60% since the financial crisis. So we're in a worse situation than we ever have been. Um, that's 60% actually relative to income as well. It's not just in, in nominal terms. So where did all this debt come from? Uh, to answer that, you have to start with the question, where does money come from? Uh, which is a slightly different question. Now, if you go and ask somebody in the, in the street, where does money come from? They're going to tell you, well, it's from the Bank of England, or it's from the European Central Bank or the Federal Reserve. And one of the reasons for that is it, it seems quite obvious, because if you look on any £10 note, it actually says, it has a manufacturer's name on the side here, it says the Bank of England. So most people assume that only central banks like the Bank of England, on behalf of the government, are able to create money. Now, the twist in the story is that only 3% of all of the money that exists is created in this way by central banks. So what is the other 97%? Well, firstly, it's just numbers in computer systems. And those numbers, that electronic money, is not created by the government or by the central bank. It's created by private banks, by HSBC, by Lloyds, by Barclays, by all of the big names that you know. So we should uh, ask a few questions about the way this system works, the way that money is created, because it has such a bearing on the situation that we have with debt. The first question is, who creates our money? Uh, second one is, how much money do they create? And then the third one is, how do they use that money? And in case you're finding it hard to believe that most of the money in the economy is created by banks, I'll just read you a quick quote from the Bank of England uh, from a paper that they released last year. They say, um, commercial banks create money in the form of bank deposits by making new loans. When a bank makes a loan, for example, to someone taking out a mortgage to buy a house, it does not typically do so by giving them thousands of pounds worth of bank notes. Instead, it credits their bank account with a bank deposit the size of the mortgage. At that moment, new money is created. So every time somebody takes out a loan from one of the commercial banks, one of the high street banks, they're actually creating new money. And th there's nothing illegal about this. It's the way the, um, the banking system works. But it means that the more debt we go into, the more money there is in the economy. So on the second question, how much money have the banks created? Well, in the UK, it took 300 years for the banking system to create the first trillion pounds. They created the second trillion pounds in the eight years running up to the financial crisis. Now, because all that money was created as loans, they also created a trillion pounds of debt at the same time. They create money and debt at the same time. And um, that was really one of the driving causes of the financial crisis, this huge creation of money and debt in such a short period of time. So on the third question, how did they use the money that they created? I mean, did they invest it in businesses in the real economy? Did they invest it in creating value for the economy? Well, of that money that they created in the eight years before the crisis, 51% went straight into the property market. And most of that wasn't for building new houses. It was for pushing up the prices of the houses that already exist. So this is one of the reasons why housing is so unaffordable right now. 31% uh, went into the financial markets, so this was things like speculation, trading, uh, mergers and acquisitions, a lot of uh, activity which you could really question the social value of, um, which doesn't really create a great deal of employment or uh, boost GDP. 8% um, of this lending was to businesses outside of the financial sector. So when most people think about banks taking money from savers, and going and investing in you know, startup businesses and entrepreneurs, that's a tiny, tiny part of what the banking sector does these days. And the remaining 8% was things like consumer credit, personal loans, uh, car loans, uh, credit cards. So that should give you an idea of why, one, why we have such an affordable housing, particularly in this country, but uh, in most countries around the world, is a very similar situation. And also why there is so much personal debt. Um, we know uh, whoever has the power to create money really has the power to shape society and determine the kind of economy that we have. Um, it has consequences beyond just house prices. It is one of the big drivers of inequality. Uh, not the only driver, but it 
pushing up house prices for a start is one of the big transfers of wealth from, well, the majority of people to those who are wealthy enough to benefit from, from rising house prices. Um, also because of all the interest that is paid, uh, we've done some analysis that shows that that interest is distributing money from the bottom, well, actually the bottom 90% to the top 10% of the population. Um, it's obviously one of the main drivers between the huge rise in personal and household debt. The more that people borrow, the more money is created, and the more that banks are willing to, to keep lending. Um, and it's also become one of the reasons why we're so dependent on economic growth, why the government is so focused on growing the economy at all costs, even if that has really negative implications for the environment, uh, for preserving energy, for um, the sustainability of, of the economy. So um, I'll just speak quickly about the alternatives. Uh, there are proposals to change this system, to stop banks having this power to create money, and to separate out the process of creating money from the process of lending and creating debt. Um, one of the ideas is that you would transfer that power to the central bank um, or to the government um, under very strict controls so that they can't abuse this power to create money. Uh, that idea is getting a lot of traction. The former chairman of the Financial Services Authority, Adair Turner, has been talking about this idea a lot. Mervyn King, who was the governor of the Bank of England until three years ago, um, is publish publishing a book this coming week where he says, you know, this is one of the big things we need to do. Uh, for anybody who's interested in a Islamic finance perspective, uh, there's a Dr. Assad Zaman, Z-A-M-A-N, who um, has written a paper on how this could uh, be done under Islamic principles as well. Um, and if you are interested in learning more about uh, the proposals to do that, to prevent banks creating money, and why that would have such a beneficial impact on debt, you can also look at the Positive Money website. Um, and we've got a load of videos and uh, books on there which explain the way this system works and how we could fix it. Uh, the, there's a growing debate now amongst economists about the fundamental problem with allowing the banking sector to create most of the money that we use. Um, and this debate is going to become more important over the next few years because we still have a system which is fundamentally based on banks creating money when they create debt. And that is the one that's going to lead us into the next financial crisis. So, um, so it's really important that we debate uh, the way we could change that system. So, thank you. Good morning. My name is Stuart Hutton from Simply Ethical. And I'm going to try and pull together a little bit about what these two have spoken about and try and give a bit of perspective in terms of uh, what's kind of going on. And, uh, maybe put a few figures that might frighten you as well in front, uh, and try and give you a, a bit of a takeaway in terms of maybe some thoughts and ideas. I don't have a solution here to present to you today. I don't think anybody has, uh, but Ben's got some great ideas he's already mentioned briefly, and certainly I'd recommend looking at his website and the videos. But to have something to take away that you can think about, and maybe today's thoughts and discussions from the event as it goes forward will also help with that. I'm going to start with a quote. I've got a couple of quotes, actually. Start with this quote, which... Um, Hopefully we'll uh, ring some bells. It goes, uh, blessed are the young, for they shall inherit the national debt. <laughs> it's a quote by Herbert Hoover, 31st president of the USA. So it's not a recent one, but I think we can pretty much look at today's value and see exactly what that means. And what is generation debt? Um, well, I took the two words, and actually it hasn't quite uh, got a gap there, excuse that, but generation, okay, people about the same age, particular family within a society in debt, we know what that is. And what I wanted to try and do, actually, was try and relate it to something that maybe you can understand. And I mentioned to a colleague of mine a couple of weeks ago, and he came up with something that he remembered about 20 years ago. he just left university, and he got his first job, and he fortunately didn't have a student loan at that point. They weren't uh, as they are today, of course. And he decided to go and buy a car. And he went around some garages, and he found this shiny BMW. He loved this car, and he thought, right, so he hadn't bought it. Uh, a couple of days later, he went to his parents' house, parked outside, went in to see his parents, and said, well, I've bought a car, and came out, they looked at it, smiled, went, very nice, okay. And his father turned around and said, uh, how did you pay for it? And he goes, well, I went in, and I signed some paperwork, and the car's mine. He said, and I'm going to pay back for it over the next five years. And he goes, okay. He said, uh, he said any idea how much? He goes, well, I know what the monthly payments are, but I don't really know, I suppose. He said, okay. He said, uh, have you got the paperwork with you? He goes, yeah, it's in the car, actually. He said, no, I haven't taken it out yet. He said, well, come in. So when he came into the house, his father was sitting at the table, the kitchen table, with a, a piece of paper and a pencil and a calculator. He didn't have Excel in those days, so it was a, a, a visual thing. And he got the paperwork, and he sat down and wrote the 60 monthly payments down. 
And then he put at the end the balloon payment, the payment at the end that he was going to have to pay at the end, which he was going to pay interest on. Now, you remember, this is back in the early 90s. Interest rates weren't as low as they are now. And they basically put this all together. And he looked at it and said, that's how much this car has cost you. And I think it was quite a shock. He remembered looking thinking, crikey, the car's not worth that. You know, what's it worth to me? I've got to run this car still. And they worked out also, if he took the balloon payment and started adding the monthly payments on, actually, if he had saved for about 15 months, he could have bought the car outright. He could have just waited. He went on to talk to me a little bit about then something more recent that he's going through. His eldest daughter is about to start university, and she's actually hoping to come to London to study medicine, and he's looking at the student loans. And he, um, he said, it's, it's shocking. He said, I'm not sure how we're going to do this. But he said, I'm going to send you a link, and you can share it with your talk if you want to, with your people and your friends and people you know, and how this works. He said, OK, I'm not going to show you the example he gave. Five years in medicine, I think, gave him a small heart attack. But I thought I'd give you an example of how this link kind of works. And if you're a student and you're starting out today and you want a student loan, £9,000, and you're looking at maybe £500 maintenance loan on top of that, so you've got a £15,000 a year, let's call it a three-year course, which is probably the shortest these courses are this year. And a starting salary, let's say, of around about £18,000 in three years' time. So I put it into this link to see what it came out with. And it came out with something that looks a bit like this. Now, this is what actually comes out here. It shows you a first monthly payment. Great news. You don't have to pay anything the first month. Fantastic. Is it felt a bit like when he bought this BMW. And then he looks at the first payment. starts about a year later. And there's a 30-year repayment plan. 30, amount borrowed 45,000. At the end of 30 years, the total amount repaid is nearly 71,500 pounds. And the graph shows you it's not too clear. But you can see you know, the capital round actually increases for the first decade. And then the green line, the payments kind of gradually reduces that. And you actually can show a full breakdown. And I, I don't know why, but I put those down here so you can see. But, you know, the first couple of years, annual repayments, nothing. The annual interest rates are start, starting to grow. By the end of the first decade, it's gone over 50,000 pounds. But you're starting to pay back. And the good news, by the end of the second decade, it's starting to reduce considerably. By the end of the third decade, it's down to 10,700 pounds, at which point it's written off. But the annual interest rate by that point is 3%. And he said, you know, this is something that my children are going to have to live with, they're going to have to work with, you know, they're going to have this debt they're going to start off with. How does it relate to today's situation? Well, I, I kind of want to take something. If you have that, what else are you going to have to consider when you go out to the big wide world, rent, you know, mortgages and all the other things that go with it? And I thought, well, I'll just give you a few figures to think about and go away with because these are relevant. These are today. This is where we are. Household debt in the UK, end of last year. Any idea how much the average household debt in the UK is? Anybody? Well, I'll tell you, nearly £54,000 per household, including mortgages, which works out around about nearly £29,000 average per adult person, which equates to around about, more frankly, about 112% of average earnings. That means the debt in the UK last year owed, personally, was around about £1.45 trillion, which is actually has increased from the previous year. What Ben mentioned about how it's increased, it's still increasing, by about £627 per adult. In fact, if you look at the interest of payments on that personal debt, I dread to press this button, but we're looking around about £52 billion in interest payments, which equates to around about, even frighteningly, about £143 million every single day. So, according to the Office of Budget Responsibility going forward, it doesn't get any better, I'm afraid. They're suggesting that household debt will reach around about two and a half trillion by 2021, increasing the average household debt to around about 95,000, just below. So where does that leave us today? And I kind of want to try and give you some kind of hope, but I think we need to kind of think about whether, what that actually means. And unfortunately, I, I pause, I don't have the actual answer to present to you now, because actually what we have at the moment is a large financial hangover. We've been living off debt for many decades, and it has grown and has continued to grow. And that is a major, major issue. In fact, that's a frightening statistic that, as of last year, 209 people a day were declared insolvent, bankrupt with some kind of insolvency. In fact, that means on that basis, from the minute I started talking, another person has been claimed insolvent on that basis. Solution? More debt? I know you didn't quite bring up in terms of... Is that the idea? Is more debt going to help? If we take more debt on, is that going to help alleviate that debt? I don't think so, and we need to think about how this works. Solution may be more something along the lines of a responsible finance, how we take that forward, and how we think what we can do and make a difference. Not necessarily today, but how we can start to make the difference going forward. I'm going to leave you finally with a quote. Uh, 
When I was younger, I did quite a lot of traveling and spending time in Africa. Whenever you get on the coaches and buses there, they have this kind of poster giving some kind of divine protection when you're traveling. And there was one bus I got onto, and I had to read it twice, and it said on the door as I was getting on, it said, in God we trust, all others must pay cash. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Stuart. Um, now, in those three fascinating talks, we covered a wide variety of issues and topics. Now, I'm going to open this discussion up to the floor. If anyone's got any questions for any of our speakers, uh, please first state your name, your question, and who your question is for. Um, in Switzerland, there's a, uh, a referendum on the idea of stopping banks being able to create money. And it might be a few years before they can actually vote. But um, I think one of the differences if the state is doing it is that they don't need to create money through lending. Mm. They can actually create money which is spent into the economy. Uh, again, not too much because you don't want to cause inflation. But that new money comes into the economy. It can actually be used to pay off some of the existing uh, debt that people have. But it also provides a stimulus to the economy and employment. Uh, you have to... Uh, you kind of have to have somebody creating money because if you don't, you will probably find that your economy slows down uh, and then you get unemployment. There's a lot of economics behind that. But, uh, but I, I would argue that it's better to have... The important thing is whoever's creating money, they have to have the right incentives. And in the current system, when it's the banks creating money, they have the incentives to create as much as possible, but that eventually leads to a crisis and then they don't create enough to keep the economy going. And what we're saying is you need to transfer that power to somebody who has the incentives to look at the, the long-term health of the economy rather than you know, short-term profit. I mean, to add to that, I think also in terms of you know, governments have an accountability that the people have more responsibility to. So you know, one of the concerns at the banks, it's driven more towards the, the private side and the aspects of the profit they can create from that. So uh, you know, it's, it, it makes sense that if a government does have at least that element of control, they're more likely to put into projects which are beneficial to the wider society. And I think going back to what I was saying at the end about responsible finance, it's about the society as a whole, as well as the individuals and the collectives taking that responsibility seriously and putting it into the hands of someone who will actually act in that way in the best interests of the people. Uh, I think expecting some sort of systemic change you know, is, I think, highly unrealistic. We've gone too fast, too far, and there's just too many political and other interests involved to expect some systemic changes. And uh, Ben, I think, indicated the, the hit that the economy would have to take to go through a true, the true overhauling of the system, to actually go to some sort of what might be called you know, Islamic or first principles kind of system for you know, money, the economy, et cetera, et cetera, I think it's too much too far. So well, it's unrealistic. And to be honest, we shouldn't be surprised by that because actually even in our own, in our own tradition, uh, there is a... Um, uh, we have that understanding that uh, ever, ever since the time of the Prophet Peace upon him and subsequently, uh, we have this understanding that actually in many of, you know, to, to, to the end times, there, will be, there is a, going to be a state of decline. And in fact, in the, even in relation to this topic of the interest and all the rest of it, uh, it was said that there will be a time when no one can escape, will, no one be, will be to, is able to escape interest, even if one individual is not dealing directly, just it is kind of in the air, if you like. So I think the, almost the best that we can do, the starting point for me is a bottom-up perspective, which I think what you were trying to talk about, being individually financially responsible. First, let's clear ourselves individually of debt or consider our, make our own decisions about, because if we're sitting here all indebted, but then you know, fantasizing about systemic change, well, there's a, there would be an irony. There is an irony in that. That's number one. And then within our own circles of friends and family and all the rest of it, look to support each other mm not to be in debt. And there are lots of kind of little initiatives like that. I mean, even if, for example, someone in your family or whatever has a business idea, for example, they need finance. Mm -hmm. Well, where are they going to go for that finance? Well, if they're going to go down the debt route, then it's just re recreating the same old problem. Can people come together and equity finance them, et cetera, et cetera? Or within, at least within our community, I'm sort of some, some interest-free uh, based financing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And even to a degree, even Zakat can come uh, into that as well. Um, I didn't mention in my talk, and I should mention, uh, very briefly, that one of the things that we've been doing at National Zakar Foundation is to provide student scholarships for our undergraduates going to university in this country who don't take the loan, are determined to go through university without taking the loan. We have contributed, in the last two years, we've uh, supported, uh, well, we've contributed up to uh, over £50,000 across two years to support uh, individuals who, uh, you know, and that equates to three to £4,000 per student per annum 
and who otherwise might work to find some of the rest of the 9,000 and then may get some help from friends and family, et cetera, et cetera. So it's about, I think, that bottom-up respons responsibility and uh, cooperation is, I think, the way forward. Okay, I mean, I think the, the, the easy way to kind of think of an analogy, if, you, if you're somebody who's kind of non, done no exercise and eat healthily, smoke, et cetera, and then someone tells you you've got to stop that, you don't do it overnight, you don't suddenly become an athlete, you don't suddenly stop eating suddenly, you know, it would, that would probably kill you more than actually continuing smoking and overeating. I think, I think what we need to do is get ourselves in a position where we can start to make and take more responsibility. And I, I, going back to what Iqbal was saying, you know, I don't think we can now expect the government or the banks to do that for us. I think you know, we need to start looking at it. And it will take decades. And I think on an individual basis, yes, you're right, on an individual basis, we need to start understanding how that could impact on our individual lives. And I, I love the idea, and Iqbal was saying about, you know, if you've got a family member who wants to start a business, I'd love to be in a position that I have four children to support them through university, help them start a business, do what they want to do. If we can do that, then that may be able to start you know, taking more responsibility of how we manage our finances going forward. Part of being true to Islam is also being aware of your context, right? It's not about, you know, we can't, we, we've got to understand the world we're living in, right? And then make our, the best optimal choices, faithful, sincere choices, and understanding the situation we're living in. We can't, we can't, you know, we, we, it's, it's, you know, and, and I'm very kind of, um, I would advise against a kind of an attitude where, we say, come forward with, oh, Islam is a solution, Islam is a solution, but where the, pra the actual just basic, basic, basic individual, f familial, community practice just basically doesn't even reflect those high principles, which are high principles, and frankly, Islamic principles when it comes to this are basic common sense, and anyone who's basic, you know, observed even the last few years of what, what's happened, and it's taken that level of crisis to Mm. alert us all to all of these issues and, and, and bring it to the forefront of our minds. It's just basic common sense and it's exact whatever has taken place you know, in the last few years is basically exactly what our tradition told us <laughs> would happen if we let this thing go crazy. And it's not about just debt. It's not even debt squared. It's debt to the power of whatever. You know, if you've watched The Big Short recently, you can have an idea of what I'm talking about. I, I suppose it depends whether you're a cynic or not, isn't it? I mean, I, mean, I, I came into Islamic finance as a practitioner probably in the last five or six years, truly. Um, and the way I viewed it was, um, with a, a conventional business behind me, was I didn't see that as a repackaging. Having spent time with kind of many of the people in this room, I've learned to see that the way many of the big banks have commercially and monetized that. And you can see that there has been some ways of maybe trying to make it look like something then that's true to Islamic finance, but actually is doing the same job as a conventional, uh, you know, conventional finance. I suppose the way to view it is, is that to strip it back down to understanding what it is about. When I first started out, I, I, the concept of Reba was still a little bit alien to me. You know, I'd grown up in the world of interest. Get the most interest you can get in your bank account. And then I started to understand why that wasn't necessarily the good thing it should be. And I think it's about stripping those things back. And the big thing for me was actually about the, the real economy. You know, uh, I mean, Ben's stuff that he, he talked about really does relate to this. Because you know, what we've got here is if money is just creating money and then creating more debt, actually, how, what purpose or use is that to us as individuals and as companies? And as a small business, you know, I, I, you know, if you want support, you know, where you're doing a good service or manufacturing or something that's useful to society, either local or nationally or even globally, you know, it's about how you can be supported in that way. And for me, Islamic finance actually principles underpin that. So we've got to get over that kind of element to some extent. I know, it, I know the majority and it's still going on and there's a lot of discussion around that and it will go on for a long time. But there's no reason why we have to then sit and wait for that to change. We can be part of that change. So yeah, but thank you for that. It's a good, good, good comment. Again, I, definitely an outside you know, observer on this, to be honest, because I've never worked in Islamic finance. I have a lot of friends who work in the, work in the field. At the end of the day, see, again, it seems to me common sense that Islamic finance will be as Islamic or as moral or as correct or appropriate, whatever, as the institutions that are involved. And the institutions will only be as Islamic, as correct, as moral, as the people who are involved. And so that doesn't mean they all need to be Muslim, necessarily, but it all comes down to the sincerity of the matter. You know, what is the ultimate motive? If the motives of the individuals and the institutions and all the rest of it is basically profit, right, as a prime motive, well then of course it's not going to be Islamic finance. If the motive is, you know, ultimately the pleasure of God, adhering to, you know, the pr religious principles, and then profit, how do we make it work, et cetera, et cetera, then, then, then it will work. So for those people who 
you look at it, and those of you here who are considering, and many of my friends, once upon a time, considered careers in Islamic finance, and they look across the industry, and they, they you know, generally come back feeling fairly, fairly hopeless and all the rest of it. it it's, and it's true. It's true, honestly. I mean, I'm, many of my good friends really sincerely wanted to do something big you know, in Islamic finance, and, and some of them are still trying. So try, and, and often, many of them who are close to me, they come and say, I don't know what I'm doing here anymore. In fact, someone in this room said that to me just this morning or a couple of hours ago, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I said to him, and I said to them, we'll even, we'll not even go to whether it was male or female, I said to them that you absolutely have to stay because ultimately all that matters is what's in here. Mm. That's all that matters because that's what we know to be true, you know, in our faith in general. If, 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 if your heart is good, you're sincere, you feel there's some space to do some good, then absolutely. And then you've done, and then we can say, okay, we did our bit, right? We did our bit, but that's, mm. It's not, it's not kind of a specific answer to the question, but it's the kind of compass maybe which you would use to, yeah. Without going into some kind of 10 minute spiel, I suppose, and worry of time, it's a, it's a really good question because it's very easy as an individual to stand here and say, I, will, I have morals, I have ethics, and I will stand to them. And I'll do everything I can to make a difference. I'll influence people around me as best I can. And, and that has an impact, there's no doubt about it. And the reason I think, it's the easiest way to translate that. When you move up to institutions, yes, there's, there's quite a battle, there's quite a headwind, shall we say, in terms of how that changes. I don't believe that I, or probably anybody in this room, has that single sole ability to make that change. I think to take one, one maybe element of it to try and help in terms of looking at things like corporate social responsibility and kind of environmental and social governance and those kind of areas, as investors become more knowledgeable, as we educate the investors more and more, they want to invest in companies that actually have those standards. And I think it's becoming more and more transparent as we kind of move forward through the investment environment. And the events of the last kind of 10, 12 years, where we've had two significant falls in the stock markets, um, back in the early kind of uh, the 2001, 2002, and then obviously more recent credit crunch, people are becoming more aware of where their money's being invested. And if an interest grows where they want to invest their money in good companies that are doing something good, companies will want to do good things Do they want to be invested in. You know, the market is a, a free flow, you know, it's a, it's a democratic system whereby if more people buy the shares, the share price goes up, you know, and therefore, you know, if they can do that, if they can be seen to be doing good things, it's not just about profit. People will invest also because of the social return they can see in that company. And the way I view it is that when looking at uh, Sharia compliance, when looking at ethical screening, this is a first start, a stage where we can start to, to put something to to help understand it. But we're a long way off from the ideal. But that will start to have an influence at the institutional level. And, and it already is, I think, to some extent. But it's early days. Yeah, so the question was along the lines of, uh, given how much debt there is in the economy, can we, uh, can we really get out of this situation? Or do we have to rely on something like debt write-downs or uh, debt forgiveness? And I think, uh, yeah, it's true. The level of debt that we have now is not it will never be significantly reduced in the current system because it's so dependent on debt. Uh, the, one of the risks of the write-off approach is that some people talk about debt forgiveness or debt write-offs in a sense that it just rewinds the clock by maybe 10 years. Mm -hmm. And then once people have lower debts, they can start borrowing again and we, we end up back where we are. So that's, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's one of the arguments for like fundamentally changing the way the whole debt system and the money system works. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people who, who have debts that they can't service that really should be written off. One of the, one of the reasons why you know, the government and the authorities wouldn't want to do that is because of the impact it would have on, on the bank balance sheets and the, the risk of it you know, leading to another bailout. Um, but it's a tricky situation to get out of. Yeah. I, I think it just comes down to in terms of um, the behavioral aspect to it, I think, I suppose. It's not just about the money. I mean, there's a behavioral aspect. We've got where we are. How can we, uh, as a culture, as a society, change the way we view debt, the way we have debt? And I think, I mean, you've always said about, you know, debt equals money, that kind of thing. If we take all the debt away, there's no money left in the system. You know, it's, it's a kind of a, 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 a difficult, cycle. Yes, it is a vicious cycle. And it wouldn't necessarily, it may feel good on day one, but, you know, if I borrowed some money from my father and then he turned around and, you know, a day later said, look, actually, don't worry about it. It feels good at that point, but I'm not necessarily kind of worse, better off. I've had to spend that money and I still need more money in that respect. So how do I, you know, where did the debt come from to begin with? I, I think it's, if, if we can 
consider it more on a behavioral level, which is why I like the idea of responsible finance as opposed to Islamic finance, because it takes into a lot more scope. It can broaden our horizons in terms of ethics and morality, whilst you know, underlying the principles of Islam being really important perspective around that. Yeah, no, I'll just finish. I think in a way we've come full circle because all of the stuff I was talking about at the beginning <laughs> yeah, was about, you know, if debt's really bad, don't get into debt. If you have to get into debt, then make sure you know how, where you're going to repay, do your damnedest to repay and all the rest of it. Now, the interesting thing about all these household debt figures is the interesting question would be how much of that debt was taken on for stuff that actually the, the, the people who have gotten to debt didn't really need. That's, you know, that's the point, right? We've, we, and, and it's just so easy. And we, I'm sure we've all perhaps bought things, I mean, in general, just even if you bought them cash, obviously, that we don't really need, right? And the fact of the matter is a lot of that debt is taken on for things that people don't really need and don't really have a particular idea or plan as to where it's going to, you know, where that repayment's going to come from. And to be honest, the debt forgiveness idea, it's just like, you know, oh, this part of my house keeps, you know, getting set on fire. I'll put out the fire, and if, unless I fireproof it or make, take the precautions, it's going to go on fire again and then again and again. So in a way, you know, and, it, and it, of course, you know, unless David Cameron becomes... Dawood Kamran and, you know, <laughs> <laughs> decides that, you know, yes, yeah, let's uh, forgive all debts. And I don't think, I don't think, I don't think that's happening any time soon. But I think the Islamic Finance and Ethics Society has been very, very clever, of course, because what they've done is, is, is say, well, look, Islamic Finance is the way forward. So let's start with debt, get that out of the way, and then realize that that's not the way forward at all. Actually, a better balance between, you know, debt and equity finance, and hopefully we'll hear more about that going forward, is probably the way forward.